Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words of this hymn, that you did indeed give us the Bible. That, uh, but Lord, we ask that you write in our hearts that next chapter, uh, that we will see your Spirit at work in our lives and in our churches and in our families. I ask, Lord, that in these next few minutes together, that you will begin the writing of that next chapter. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, um, <clears throat> we've come to our last session together, and um, it's been quite a journey, I can tell you. <clears throat> and uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'd like to stay here as long as possible tonight, because my wife had a few words with me about suggesting that I was married to one of the beasts of Daniel 7 this morning in my sermon. <clears throat> Uh, she, am I the, the, the bear, or am I the four-headed leopard, or am I the undescri indescribable beast? Um, so I expect to be destroyed tonight. <laughs> That's a joke. Yes. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> so um, we have a steering committee. Um, Pastor Kelly was served on the steering committee. Pastor Ivor Myers was on the steering committee. Uh, Dr. Roy Gain was on the steering committee. Um, Pastor John Whitcomb was on the steering committee. Um, we wanted to make sure... Was there somebody I missed? Michael Junker. Yes, Michael Junker. Is Michael still here? Yes, okay. We had a wonderful steering committee. We chose that steering committee deliberately so that all the major views would be represented. And as we've worked together over the last six to seven months, we've had a wonderful collegial spirit. Uh, we've worked through um, how we're going to structure this, who's going to be speaking, how the two days are going to be structured. I'd just like to say thank you to our steering committee for being such a great team to work with. It's been an amazing journey with all of you. Um, we try to foster a, an attitude of, of, of growth and, and uh, how can we encourage people to study more and maybe to move out of their trenches into what we previously considered no man's land. You know, when, you, when you're counseling with someone who maybe has depression, a very useful to question to ask is, uh, what are you hoping for? It kind of changes the whole conversation. It helps people think about what their hopes and dreams really are, rather than the problems that they face. And so, uh, I'd just like to ask uh, a very open-ended question tonight. Uh, first of all, for, our, for those who were speakers, so if you were a speaker yesterday, or you were a speaker today, um, we'd just like to ask you a question, you know, how have you grown? You know, what have you learned that you didn't know before? Or what areas are you going to go back and do further study in? Um, I just want to emphasize, you know, how have we grown and um, what's intrigued us over the last couple of days as we spent this time together? Once we've heard from the panel, we'll then take uh, a couple of questions from the congregation um, before we draw to a close. We'll try and be out of here by 8.15. Um, so um, if we have a roving mic, Pastor Myers, you go first. Um, for our panel members, you, you can stick your hands up when, when you, you know, lightning strikes, you have inspiration. Uh, Pastor Myers. Yeah. I just uh, want to say that I appreciate, I appreciate, um, you know, when, you're, when you haven't met other people and you um, read their views, you disagree with their views, there's a tendency to be like, yeah, you know what, I think he's a Jesuit too. You know, <laughs> stuff like that. <clears throat> and then when you meet these people that you, you know, disagree with, you're like, man, that's a nice, why do I have to disagree with him? He's such a nice guy. But it just gives a whole different, uh, different feel, you know, and appreciation for, uh, for people who are all seeking truth. You know, I don't think anyone is, is uh, any one of these presenters is here trying to um, mislead or lead astray in any, in any way, but I think we're all genuinely seeking for truth, and I think coming together like this was a, a really good um, exercise. And uh, yeah, there was a lot I learned from a lot of the different positions. And you know, for me, kind of stepping back and seeing all the areas of, of agreement and you know, where there are certain things that maybe have been unanswered that you know, can be dealt with, all those things I think were just a blessing for me. So um, yeah, it was definitely a, a good experience. Thank you. All right, any, any of our speakers uh, want to share? Uh, Tim, yes, thank you. Tim spoke yesterday. He was our first speaker on Friday morning. I really appreciated something Randy Yonker was, sh oh, stand up, all right. <laughs> that Randy Yonker was sharing that both the Christians and the Muslims were using Daniel 11. Mm -hmm. Now, what's exciting about that to me is I'm often in a mosque. Mm -hmm. And I can, I'm now going to be studying this material. Mm -hmm. 
and I can already make friends with them, with the Islam view, within five to ten minutes. Mm -hmm. But when I incorporate things that Muslims have said and how they've already seen this, it's going to be even more powerful mm -hmm. when I'm in a mosque. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was intrigued by what uh, Dr. Randy was sharing earlier today on, on Muslims studying the prophecies of Daniel as well. Of course, Muslims, some of them do say that the stone that hits the statue is the rise of Islam, the worldwide caliphate, not the second coming of Jesus. Uh, Brother Hugo, uh, just behind there. Uh, thank you. Yes, I do believe that we need to have unity and consensus in our interpretation of prophecy before the final events. And I do believe that we are doing what we are counseled to do in the spirit of prophecy in the Bible. We're coming together as brothers and sisters. We're praying. We're asking the Holy Spirit to lead us. And I think we will see the fruits of our labor mm -hmm. as we move on. I think this is just the beginning of a process that needs to happen. Uh, thank you. All right, uh, Brother Samuel. I appreciated the, the opportunity to meet also with others who have maybe a similar view in those um, clusters that mm -hmm. we had. And we found out that we're looking at the same text with similar presuppositions, mm -hmm. yes, as to what the text says. And we're also seeing it differently. Mm -hmm. So I was hearing things I had never seen before, and it was true. I was like, wow, that's a great point. It's, it's in the text. And so appreciated that opportunity to also hear others who might have a similar view, but yet we might have some differences too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, Brother Jim. Being a historian um, and having studied theology, um, <clears throat> I've been driven all my life to study history and prophecy, and um, coming from an atheistic home and being converted at 13 or 14 years old, um, I've always been convinced that prophecy is the proof of God's existence. And um, um, I see, um, I read everything, everything that people have posted so far, and um, I'm driven for detail because the more you understand history, the more you can understand prophecy. And I've enjoyed the presentations. And it seems that a lot of light bulbs have come on into my mind um, as the people spoke. But unfortunately, maybe, the light bulbs just um, shone my position more clearly in my understanding. <laughs> So <laughs> I'm waiting for the Holy Spirit to knock me over the head and tell me, okay, McNulty is right, or um, John Wickham, or someone else. Yeah. But I really appreciate the work you guys have done. And Thank, you. Thank you. Thank um, you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Norman McNulty. No, I just want to say that it was a privilege to be here with all of you this weekend, and you know, I've never been in a place where all the views were shared at the same time. The, the main views, and even some other variant views that I found very fascinating. And the thing I did appreciate was the spirit that pervaded the meeting. And I hope that we take that away from this meeting with us. And as we continue to study, that we keep that spirit and that we have um, a Christ-like spirit towards everyone, those that we don't always see the same position, but I'm, I'm thankful for how the Holy Spirit was with us this weekend. So. Thank you. And we have a Pastor Ken Lebrun uh, back there. Yeah, I was delighted to find um, things in the presentations of each of the speakers of the of the groups that I was not a part of that I could agree with and that they actually presented some of those points better than I've ever understood them before. And um, so I was blessed by listening to, to each of the speakers because I gained some knowledge um, that really was helpful to me uh, from all of them. And Pastor Whitcomb? Yes, I want to affirm the same. Um, <clears throat> there's a, Ellen White says that the 144,000 were perfectly united. Now, that, I take that as a prophecy. 
perfectly united. So I believe we are going to be perfectly united on our prophetic message. We're told that we must prophesy again, and I think we have to all be speaking the same thing, perfectly united. So, so we need to uh, make this seminar, this symposium here, the first of many more to come. Thank you. Dr. Kim Kier. Yes, I just want to um, echo uh, all my brothers and who have uh, already spoken and saying it was a delightful experience and I have heard some things that I never would have heard had I been in my own little cocoon and uh, I appreciate very much all the different perspectives. Um, the spirit of, was good and God essentially is more concerned about our unity than our view of Daniel 11, um, but both are very important. And I think as we, as we do more of this and come closer into unity, God will continue to open and reveal so that we will all come uh, united and then we can present to the world a united view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. And then we have uh, Dr. Jim Side. I very much appreciated the collegiality and the spirit of wanting to come together. And I'm, I'm very touched by that. I'm also grateful to have heard large views, minutia views, incredibly detailed views, and views of broad strokes never completed. <laughs> which always piques my attention further. And I would welcome, and I'd like to pursue this even personally, detailed, not just dialogue, but study, collegial study, to not just hear each other lecture with each other, which we've done for years, by the way, mm -hmm. but actually sit down and study, take a week and just study, have someone put food under the door and leave us alone. <laughs> and just study together and really come together that the Holy Spirit can move us as we did in the early days, even in the upper room. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, thank you, Dr. Jim. Uh, Dr. Roy Gain? Yes, what, what I'm hearing is that we need to continue, and I would agree with that, and I'll give a reason that hasn't been mentioned why we should uh, pursue this and part of the stakes involved with all of this, and that is to say that historicism in the world generally is dead. Mm -hmm. People do not look at these things any, this way anymore, since 1844, basically. And um, for example, when I was studying at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem um, under the great Shalom Paul, who's a good friend of mine, um, I, this is years ago when I was there, and I, um, I wrote a prospectus about a three or four page little uh, description of what I wanted to do for a research paper for him a major research paper. And what I wanted to do was to just investigate the question of whether or not Antiochus Epiphanes was really the little horn. And his response was, that's a kinky idea. In other words, to question whether, because we all know that Antiochus Epiphanes is the little horn. It is a, a dogma, it's a, a belief, it's absolutely established. And I go every year to the Society of Biblical Literature. Um, I often try to get into the Daniel section to listen to what's going on. Now, I know that Samuel has been there before, I've seen him. And um, if I were to, pres to propose a paper to read in that section, and I were to mention that I were questioning in any way whether Antiochus Epiphanes was the little horn, uh, that paper would, would be rejected. You have to bow to the altar of Antiochus as you go in. So um, it's, it's a very serious thing. Adventists have no traction in the outside world with regard to this so far. We do our evangelism to people, uh, but, but not the scholars. We can't reach them. And a lot, of, a lot of people are trained by these scholars. They train the people that, that uh, teach the ministers that are teaching the people in the church. So, and, and here's the punchline to that, and that is Daniel 11 is very crucial to them because they regard that, which it is, as the most detailed of the prophecies. So they start there and work back. We tend to work forward, but we've never really settled Daniel 11. We don't have a position on Daniel 11. And consequently, this is part of the thing that weakens 
Adventists in the eyes of these preterists and all these people that believe that it's all back there because um, if we don't have a position on Daniel 11, there must be something seriously wrong with our methodology and our, our historicist approach. Mm -hmm. So we need to get together, and I agree with, um, with, uh, with Brother Whitcomb, Pastor Whitcomb, that we need to, to work towards um, this and dialogue, narrow the gap. And we don't have to come into complete agreement on everything, but at least if we have something that's coherent, that can be understood, understandable, and make sense to people outside our Adventist box. That's what needs to happen. Our other beliefs, we can do that with evangelism. We can't do it yet with Daniel 11. We need to. And so I'm praying for uh, this and for unity. A great spirit. I've learned a lot myself. Uh, and I agree that there, as Ken LeBrun said, a lot of things, um, the way people said things were better than what I'd thought of saying them. And I'm going to incorporate that into my own thinking, research, and writing in the future. So thank you very much. Okay. God bless everybody. Well, thank you, Dr. Roy. Um, over at the front here, Pastor Ron. Um, you talk about unity, but we should still call it the steering committee, not the compliance committee. <laughs> um, this is just a confirmation of what's already been said, but um, uh, one of my professors, Don Leatherman, wrote an article in the 90s on Daniel 10, 11, and 12 and discussed the history and how we don't really have a settled interpretation. And toward the end of the article, he gave an exhortation that basically said something like this. He said, I don't pretend to have a cogent full interpretation of Daniel's last apocalypse. But I hope that through earnest collaboration, through study, and through fervent prayer, the academic folks, the pastors, the scholars, and the whole nine yards will get together in earnest collaboration with the hopes of eventually finding one. And he basically offered an appeal for the thought leaders in the church to pursue that. And I see this weekend as a step in that direction, and I would just like to encourage the uh, compliance committee <laughs> to, keep, to go forward with it, because it, 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 it's definitely something that we, can, we should keep pursuing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Brother Burgess, Brother Scott. Well, hello. Uh, yes, I have, I have very much appreciated Before I came here, I was, I was asking my students at Washington Hills College to be praying in advance. Uh, not that you know one view would be superior to another, but for you know a humble spirit, a teachable spirit, because if we all go in thinking, well, we've got it right, and everyone else is foolish, well, we'll just go out as foolish as we came. And so I I was very pleased when I came here that people were very respectful, and I noticed that the easiest way to determine that uh, afterwards, you know, people would just have kind things to say, you know, supportive to each other. And I thought, well, this is a sweet spirit, and I'm reminded too. Ellen White speaks, she's talking about camp meetings, but it's, I would say loosely we could apply it here. She sees, you know, toward the end, people got little camps kind of, you know, um, sort of their Bible spread out studying. And I thought this seemed to give me a glimmer of hope that, ah, we're headed that direction. And if we could do that, we can come into unity of the faith. Mm -hmm. And, you know, prophecy ignited this movement. And I think if we come to a correct unified understanding on Daniel 11, that too we can finish and a correct, unified interpretation of prophecy will be part of that unity. Mm -hmm. so, anyways, I would encourage all of you to be praying that we, can, that we can go from here, not just saying, oh, that was fun, but yes, that we can continue to study and we can start to, to merge onto the mm -hmm. right path. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Randy? Yeah, excuse, I've been struggling with a cold and a little cough, so I'm always a little reticent. I'm going to bust out coughing here, but I've enjoyed this immensely. And I want to commend the, uh, the church here, Pastor Kelly, and uh, those of you that were on the steering committee. Uh, a number of us have been actually asking church leadership to take the initiative to help sponsor these kinds of things, but there's been some reticence. I think they're afraid. They're afraid maybe there'll be a fight, or maybe they're afraid what direction it'll go. I know I personally have been promised by certain church leaders, yeah, we'll get to that, we'll get there. We're going to have a Daniel 11 conference, but it hasn't happened after several years. So I want to commend you for taking the initiative. And I think that this uh, displayed the spirit that they were afraid we wouldn't have, but we do, actually. I think we all love the Bible. We believe in the Word of God. We believe we're a prophetic movement. We think that God has a place for us. And we also realize we're in a point in history where we think that this book now has something to say to us. Mm -hmm. 
And so I'm glad that many people are taking the initiative. I was also uh, impressed with the knowledge base so many of you have. The details you're getting into, I was thinking, wow, where did they, you know, how did they know that, you know? And so that was nice. The other thing I noticed was there's a lot of overlap of commonality. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, uh, that was very nice. I think we need to highlight those things because those are things that can pull us together. And then we can focus on the differences more and uh, see if we can actually come together more on those. I also uh, think that not all of our ideas are mutually exclusive. Sometimes, you know, when you read somebody, you hear somebody, you think, well, that guy's way off in left field. I can never agree with that. But when you actually hear it expressed, you realize, well, maybe our views are even compatible. Mm -hmm. Maybe both are true, actually. They're not necessarily mutually exclusive. So there are a lot of things that I learned uh, meeting you all personally that were, you know, participating was a real blessing for me. And again, I just want to commend uh, the church here, Village, being willing to sponsor this. And I agree with my colleague, Roy. This is something that needs to continue. Uh, you know, maybe we'll have uh, various formats, ways we can get down to the nitty gritty more. But this was a wonderful beginning. And again, I want to thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, just behind you, Brother Yon Stephenson, who spoke this morning in Sabbath school. And uh, Brother Yon, I just want to say you, you are able to communicate historical um, flows in, in a very precise and winsome way. It was a blessing this morning. Well, well thank you for that, Conrad. Uh, I just wanted to echo what some people have said here and maybe add a tiny bit of even more encouragement. And that is that when you look at the history of the church, um, when we had disagreements on prophetic interpretation, uh, when um, the spirit was unchristian and very much into debate, there was not a lot of further understanding. And the fact that we see that people with different views can come together and have a Christian spirit, that not only is a nice experience, if that is continued, that is a promise that God might actually this time around be able to give more understanding. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very encouraging thought. Uh, thank you so much, Brother Yon. Um, uh, I've answered my own question. Yes, Brother David, over here. Uh, Brother David spoke yesterday morning. I agree that we need to keep studying prophecy, but I would like to reiterate my opening remarks from yesterday morning. And that is, prophecy is a fragment of the knowledge that God wants us to acquire. And that knowledge must be added to faith and virtue. And the knowledge that the people had back in the 1840s and on was an experimental knowledge that we do not have. And the reason why we do not have it is because we have not been proactively and intentionally acquiring the traits listed in the Beatitudes and 2 Peter chapter 1 and incorporating that into our practice, into our school curriculums, into our sermons. One of the things that I appreciated very much was when uh, Brother Hardy was up and showing the chiasms. One of the things that I think was missing from that is the persecution of God's people before Christ died and the persecution of God's people after Christ died. And what we need to realize is that it is true what Paul wrote. All godly will suffer persecution. And when we ask ourselves the question, why are we not persecuted? Jesus said the servants will not be treated any better than the master. We have to ask ourselves the question, why are we still here? It's because maybe we have our priorities wrong. And we need to acknowledge the witness, the true witness who says, you think you are rich. We may be rich in knowledge, but it's not an experimental knowledge. And so I'll end it at that, but I, I've appreciated other comments about the whys. Brother, you're, I really do appreciate what you presented on that. We needed to hear that. And there are other things too. And we can come together in unity as we press towards the truth as it is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. I, um, if I answer my own question, what did I learn or what struck me? It was this afternoon when Brother Frank, you were speaking about the centrality of Jesus in chapter 11. I've always seen chapter 11 as a flow of earthly powers. 
and where, who's the king of the north and who's the king of the south. And I've just kind of, I view the death of Jesus and then in the middle of the chapter is just kind of like another way mark in the chapter. And what you highlighted was that Jesus is the center of the chapter and he's at the beginning and he's at the end. And I want to thank you for that, for bringing the centrality of Jesus back into Daniel 11. It was a short presentation. I know you didn't have much time, um, but I want to thank you for that. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of time for just a couple of questions. And Dr. Gerard Darmstiegt, you've been waiting patiently, I know, for a number of hours to ask a question. Is that right? Uh, a, a little birdie whispered in my ear that you had a, a pressing question for somebody. Okay. Well, this is your chance to ask it now, Brother, uh, Dr. Darmstiegt, if you would like to ask your question. You know, I have been teaching prophecy now for about 30 years. And uh, especially I have focused on the development, how we got the ideas. And basically about 90 plus percent of what we understand of prophecy came from other churches. The early church, the Protestant churches, and whatever. And yet we got news, especially in 1844. But the added news was built on the whole platform of the past. And so over the years I have observed the new ideas that are coming up. And frequently it is, look at exegesis. Look at the text. Our pioneers and the reformers, you know, I mean, they didn't know, they didn't know how to do the text. But it's interesting that as a theologian and as a historian, you look at the history. And if you see here how the study goes, and that is what the text says, and that should be, the, and then when you compare it with what those exegetes come up with, historical things, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And so instead of having a conflict between history and exegesis, there is a need to come together. I mean, the early Christians, the reformers, I mean, you know, fantastic insights. And they combined the biblical knowledge with the history. But today, Oh, yes, you know, if for many, many years, it was always the year day principle. Now, the new insight is, if you look at a text, you cannot talk about the year day principle. You have to talk about the day year principle. For hundreds of years, we had it like this, and now the new insight is, we have to change our terminology. The same like... Uh, you know, I mean, I may as well say it, brother. <laughs> Some of the new insights, especially in regard to the Islam and whatever, very interesting. But then the historians say, where do they come from? And you go and you see there the evangelicals and the other Protestants. Now, why did they focus on this? What happened in 1844? In 1844, Historicism was basically rejected because it doesn't work. Historicism ends up in a tragic disappointment. And so the decline of historicism goes after 1844 and in the 20th century, it's hard to find this. Yes, sir. So what do people now do? From my understanding of the development of prophetic interpretation, you see then that they are dealing with a text, no more history with a text. And what do they then discover? Literary structures. This structure, that structure, that structure. Before 1844, who spoke about chiasm? Now, everybody... And what they do here is that they take the structure of chiasm and they impose it on history. Is that how we have to go? You know, so in other words, we are now encapsulated 
with a certain exegetical literary structure, you know, emphasis by non-Adventists. And what we do now is, where is true Adventism? And then suddenly we cannot even find problems. We have problems now with, with, with the uh, trans evolution, uh, the woes. We have problems with the trumpets. And they go out, out, out. Okay, so I have to stop, I think. Yes. But, <laughs> do, do, but, do, you, do you have a, you have a question from the brother? <laughs> okay, so the question is... <laughs> the question is, think about those things. How you approach the text. Look here, I mean, we have prophetic faith of our fathers. Beautiful thing. What did the reformers, how did they discover this? And presently, I'm, I'm, I'm developing a book on the development of prophetic interpretation. Not 4,000 pages like Froome, but something like 300 pages. But it is amazing if you see then how the approach to prophecy has changed and how many new ideas have invaded our church, but not coming from historicists. And that is my concern, friends. And uh, so I hope that each one of us does some study how things developed. What are the changes that we are bringing in our church? I went to many non universities, and if I bring a new insight in, I take it from them and I teach my students it. But does it bring them closer to the Lord and to an experiential experience with historicism? And I think that is something that we have to, have to see, because I think historicism is an endangered species, even among a number of Adventists. Brother, you would you? Thank you, Brother Domstead. OK, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, Brother de Kock, you haven't spoken yet. We need to bring this to a, a, a close soon. So. I want to add to this concern. The spirit, well, let me stand. This has been a good spirit regarding Daniel 11 in comparison with some other things, but we have to face it that there is the much larger issue of many of our other well-established explanations that are being assaulted from within the church now, uh, urging ideas that were imported from outside. Now, I know this because I had to struggle with this thing of the number 666 in uh, Revelation 13. And this is being questioned, we know that. And I am afraid that the assault of uh, preterism, futurism, and idealism is a reality in our midst. And that fills me with deep concern. I, I think, Brother de Kock, that we all share that concern. Uh, certainly, as you look at our interpretation of, say, the trumpets, it seems to me we're nibbling away at the sixth trumpet, then back to the fifth trumpet, and so forth. And um, I share those concerns. But on the other hand, um, I am actually optimistic, because today, when there was a major worldview conference at Andrews, and there was an alumni event at Andrews Academy, this place was packed, which tells me that there are Adventists here in Bering Springs, a large number came out because they're interested in prophecy, and they're interested in historicism, and they want to understand these prophecies. So um, today has given me a lot of hope, Brother de Kock, that um, yes, the, the winds of strife may, may blow through our church, um, theologically as well as ecclesiastically, but uh, God is still in control. And uh, we're here today because we still hold the historicist approach. So thank you for sharing that concern. Um, Brother Pastor Kelly is going to lead us in a, clo uh, a, a season of prayer as he comes up. Um, is, sister, is your wife here, Pastor Kelly? All right, well, um, before you close in prayer, I just want to say that um, Sister Kelly has been hard at work with the food. 
with a team of people. Uh, they've kept us well fed. And um, I want to say thank you on behalf of everybody here for the delicious food that has been put on by your, your wife, your daughter, Julie. Mm -hmm. And it's been, it's been a beautiful thing. So thank you on behalf yeah, of everybody. For sure. And I want to... I'll pass that back along and uh, Stacy Gusky and our team of hospitality. And then also just before we pray as well, uh, Dr. Vine has been the one that has kept us on task and dialogued with so many and we're deeply thankful for your Thank work you. too. So. so let's do this, all right? We have a few minutes left. We'd like to invite you to turn to somebody nearby and have about a three-minute segment of prayer. When you hear the piano playing, it's time for you to tie your prayers off in the same way as Dr. Vine approaches you or someone else. It's time for the spirit of the prophets to be subject to the prophets. So find a person or two. Let's pray when you hear the piano. If you'll tie your praying off, and we'll have a final benediction. So.
Number 214, if you'll take your hymn books out and stand with me, we'll close with both verses of We Have This Hope. thoughts if you would turn your survey in. Also, there is a table with some free uh, books and cards for ministry from some of our presenters. And lastly, if you would pick the debris from your pew area when you leave and drop it in a trash can, there's one in the coat closet. As you walk out in the right, we would appreciate that. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this great hope that we do have centered in the very person of who you are. I'm asking, Lord, that as we go forward, we could help each other. And I'm praying, Lord, that there would be such a sweetness in our midst that the world would know that we have a unique experience with God, one that rises above regular theological wrangling into an arena of deep, humble study. So bless us now. Thank you for everyone that's put time, energy, and effort to make this weekend work from our sound crew to every deacon and every other person. So now, Lord, bless everyone, and may we go out with your peace, your joy, your hope, and may we search for these truths as for treasure. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God be with you.